Welcome, I'm Jim Falk, and today with co-host Jim Cathcart, we ask one of our nation's premier foreign policy experts, Dr. George Friedman, the founder and chairman of Geopolitical Futures, to peer into his crystal ball to discuss the year ahead. And it just so happens that George has been working feverishly over the last few days, maybe even the last 24 hours, to complete Global Trends and Forecast 22. In other words, we're getting it hot off the press. Jim? Dr. Friedman, thank you for the early look at this work. It is compelling. And there's so many moving parts in this scene. What are the critical parts we can focus on? Well, we have to focus on the Northern Hemisphere. It contains four countries, China, Russia, the United States, and of course, Europe, sort of a country. And each of these countries dominate the globe together. Uh, Each of them are having severe internal problems, partly because of COVID and also other things. And each of them are competing with each other uh, on various in various dimensions. So when we look at uh, what's happening, we have to look at these four countries, each of which are unique. And when we start to understand what they have to do, we can start predicting what they're going to do. George, let's begin by focusing on Russia and Ukraine, because that certainly seems uh, to be a, a hot button right now. And help us understand why Ukraine is so important to Russia. Well, when the Soviet Union collapsed, Russia lost its borderlands. Russia has been invaded from the West four times since the 17th century, from the South twice. Uh, the Russia exists because of these borders. Now, it's moved to try to take control of the Caucasus, blocking the Turks. It's moved to take control of Belarus, the North European plain. But the heart of Russia's defense system historically, for centuries, has been Ukraine. It could live with a Ukraine that it was confident was not going to be engaged in joining NATO or having Western forces or what have you. But when it was no longer certain of that, that really began in 2014, uh, Russia had to take some sort of action. Now, it hasn't exactly taken action. It has made some gestures. And... It becomes now a military problem. What can it do? What risks does it run? And so on. But it's doing what is predictable. And I actually may say, three years ago, I predicted that Russia was now ready to begin trying to regain the borderlands. Well, how is the response from the U.S. and Europe perhaps different as how they look at this issue? Well, here you can't talk about Europe as one. The German position is that it wants to have energy from Russia and is really interested in getting involved in economic development. Russia's biggest problem is it remains very close to a third world country. Germany sees this as an opportunity. The Polish view of this is I saw this in 1939 and I'm not really eager to see it again. Uh, And each of the European countries have a different view. France sees this as an opportunity to dominate Europe with Germans out of the picture. And the the basic thing that the Russians are taking advantage of is the fragmentation of the European countries, which in turn is a fragmentation of NATO. So what we're really seeing here is Russia very shrewdly taking advantage of certain inherent fractures and the United States now moving toward a counter to to the Russians, a military counter. So this is like a huge chessboard, and there's four primary pieces in the game. Uh, We've got two right there. That's Russia and and Europe, and Europe's got its own internal chess game going on, so to speak. What about the effect of China and North America? Well, China's significance has actually declined somewhat precipitously in the past few months. China is a began as a low-cost exporting country. Mm -hmm. Last one, first one of these was the United States. The United States, after the Civil War, was a low-cost exporting country. By the time 1900 came, half the manufactured goods in the world were being produced by the United States. And then the United States, 40 years later, crashed because the Europeans were not in a position to buy. 
we saw the same thing happen with the Japanese. They come out of the disaster of World War II. Uh, they begin being a low-cost producer. Made in Japan was a joke uh, back when I was a kid. Uh, and then they emerge as a major technical power. But first, they had to have a crash. In 1990, they had a major financial crisis that it took them a decade to get out of. China's now in that position. It's now exactly 40 years since uh, Deng Xiaoping began this process to get away from Maoism and has run its course, but major imbalances have developed in the economy. And what we're seeing in the economy in the, the current crises in the uh, real estate business, but they go much deeper. This is an economy that grew fast, grew hard, and grew imbalanced. At the same time, it has domestic political problems, mm -hmm. uh, and, chi and the Chinese are engaged in massive suppression in China because they're terrified of what's going to happen from a recession in China, which it hasn't had. In the meantime, its appetite for trying to challenge the United States, where the United States didn't back off and even slightly, China is terrified of the United States. China is an exporting country. All of its exports come out of the East Coast ports, and the U.S. Navy is sitting right outside of the mines, torpedoes, submarines, and everything else. It tried to push the United States out. Couldn't quite do it. The United States remained in place. The Chinese have dropped the idea of invading Taiwan, which was not going to happen anyway. And so what we are in right now is uh, China is inward and trying to balance itself. Mm -hmm. The United States has temporarily relaxed over the question of Taiwan and such things. They're looking to the Russians, which is what the Chinese want. Please go look at somebody else, not me. And but, you notice how these things change. They certainly change, George. And, and what puzzles me is when you look at last October, uh, China had more overflights over Taiwan than, than a very, very long time, if ever. Why were they doing that? Was that for domestic consumption or, or, or why poke the United States and push the United States to come out and, and, and express its strong defense of, of Taiwan? Well, the problem was that having these flights convinced the United States that Ch Taiwan is going to be invaded. The constant discussion by China of Taiwan, right? right. So one thing when you're doing an amphibious assault don't let the other guy know you're coming. So once you've let him come, and then you can do something. Why did they do it? Uh, partly because they misread the United States. They thought they could bluff the United States out of position. If the United States didn't have a stomach for this. Hmm. Secondly, for domestic reasons. Uh, but thirdly, it really drove home to the global markets that China is a great power, challenging the United States. And it was a time at which the Chinese knew they were in serious economic trouble, where they needed foreign capital to stupid stabilize their system. And oddly enough, this had more to do with their knowledge of the status of the financial markets and the ignorance by the Europeans and others of the status of their financial markets. It really made them look great. Is this an area where the United States and the Biden administration deserve some credit by strengthening the Quad and creating alliances with Singapore, Vietnam, et cetera? Well, the Quad basically got organized by the Indians and the Australians. Then the United States blessed it, and it was Trump who was the first one behind it. Uh, I have to say very early in the program that I take presidents not very seriously in foreign policy. Not because foreign policy is a wish. This is what I would like to see happen. This is what my policy is. Geopolitics is the reality of what you must do, what you can't do, what the other guy can't do. So I try not to use the term foreign policy because it's a compendium of hope. Uh, I look at national power, which is you can have many policies that you can't carry out. And what I try to do with my gang is, okay, what can't they do? That's the first thing I ask. What can they do? This makes it very simple <laughs> because if you eliminate all the things you can't do, and include all the things you can do, there's only three or four. You know, something that really got my attention in your report was how 
dependent these countries are, these major players are on economics, on, on physical realities, on supply chains, on on a number of limitations that are way beyond the control of one politician. Because I had gone into this thinking, well, what if so-and-so was no longer in power? And I realize now that that's not where the power comes from so much. Well, it's a myth of the king. The king knows all and will take care of us. It's a comforting <laughs> thoughts that somebody's in charge. A nation is three things. It's political system, it's economic system, and it's military system. Mm -hmm. And they interchange and interplay, okay? And each have limits, each have cycles, each have models. We don't want to think that we're living in a world that's out of our control. So we imbue the president with all sorts of mythical powers. This is something Trump understood. He imbued himself with mythical powers, and he was believed. Biden is a more modest man. Everybody's panicking. So... This is, goes back in human history, the need to see the political leader as somehow a great warrior and a brilliant businessman. When you look at all the moving parts in Europe, you've got power plays going on constantly. George, you've done a great job of, of explaining how that fits together and or never will fit together. Would you give us more insight into that? Well, remember the Maastricht Treaty, which created the European Union was signed about the same time the Soviet Union collapsed. And my friend, uh, Frank Fukuyama, was proclaiming the end of history and everybody was going on. Since then, history has gone a couple of other rounds. And the problem is that the goal was peace and prosperity. Mm -hmm. Well, Europe has never had peace. We've only had 20, 30 years of it. I mean, wars after war after war. Uh, prosperity? Not even. Uh, Germany is prosperous. Italy is having its troubles. Greece is Greece and always will be. Uh, so what we have here are not just utterly different nations, but nations with a great history of hatred for each other. Hmm. Take a poll and have them talk to a German, okay? Uh, think about the French and the bitterness at the way Germany united. And this is a, an organization that was fine as a free trade zone, but has become some, I think of a semi-nation. The nations has, still have sovereignty, but the European court can override them, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have a situation where when immigration takes place and the Hungarians say, I don't want any, the Germans say, how dare you? And the tensions build and build and build until the distrust within the system uh, just overwhelms it. You, you can't unite these countries easily. And these are not easy times. So we have a European Union that continues to function, but the central bank has to either serve Germany or Italy. They have very different needs from a monetary policy point of view. Despite what you've said about the role of political leaders, uh, Europe certainly had a major change uh, earlier uh, or late last year when Angela Merkel stepped down after 16 years. Can Macron, will he be, in a sense, the new leader of Europe and will he be successful? Well, Europe's never had a leader. The newspapers entitled Merkel the leader. Germany happened to be the most powerful economic power. And because of that economic power, it had outsized influence. It was not Merkel, okay? But you also understand that Germany had a tremendous weakness. Germany derives almost 50% of its GDP from exports, which means Germany is utterly dependent on its customers, many of whom are in Europe. If Europe goes into depression, Germany goes into a super depression. So Germany is a very insecure country. And since people don't tend to take a look at what their GDP constitutes, it appears to be powerful, but the dependency is fantastic. And they were terrified when the British left. The British was the second largest economy, the buttress of Germany within this structure. And it left primarily because when everything was said and done, they didn't want to be the buttress of a failing system. Mm -hmm. And so we look at Europe as a place that has solved many problems, 
but there's so many coming up continually, okay, that Germany now looks at Russia one way, uh, Italy looks at it another way. There's not, no, we talk of Europe, I talk of Europe, but we can no longer simply talk of Europe. We have to talk about the old European nations. Remember, this is the smallest continent in the, in the world, except for Australia, which my wife insists is a continent. Uh, she's Australian. Uh, it has 44 sovereign states. Let's, so, let's shift hemispheres and let's come to America and look at all the domestic unrest that's going on here, all the upheaval in politics and the rest of the world seeing us only through the filter of mainstream media. But I think many of them are forming policies and entering into agreements with us based on their impressions from the media. What, what are your views on North America and its next best steps? I was in Europe in the 1970s when they declared the United States was collapsing. There were assassinations. There were riots. Uh, the Black Panthers were there. Uh, the various movements were developing from the war. The United States is a very peculiar country. Every 50 years or so, for reason I can go into, but it's very hard to, we break down. We broke down in the 1920s and 30s. We broke down in the 70s. We're breaking down now. And one of the reasons the breakdown is we move so quickly. So the automobile was the great driver of uh, the Roosevelt era until finally it was exhausted. You couldn't do anything more with it. It was a commodity. We were driven in our era by the microchip and all those things that it could do. And it's become a commodity. We can't think of other things. So as the return on capital on the main driver declines, and as the ability of them to manage themselves declines, so does the social system. And what reemerges is the eternal problem of the United States, racism. It goes back to the founding, and we've never dealt with it, can't deal with it. Uh, what comes from that is economic problem, and we get a little present this time, COVID uh, also. But we get through these crises because we reinvent ourselves. Roosevelt reinvented the United States. Reagan reinvented the United States. There's someone coming five, six years from now that will have a new vision of what we are. You know, we have just a few more minutes, and George, I don't want you to go without asking you to comment on what America's withdrawal and the way we withdrew from Afghanistan, what's the impact of that on the American psyche to enter into different foreign policy scenarios, as well as how our allies view us? Ever since Vietnam, the United States has operated in the assumption that the American military can achieve anything. It can't. Not only because of its size, but because we are very good at technical wars against technical armies and very bad at dealing with counterinsurgencies. What I hope, personally, if I could say, uh, is the result of Afghanistan, we will stop going to war without the consideration of whether we can win. We never truly won in Iraq. We didn't win in Afghanistan. So I think the American foreign policy should be as follows. The United States has one virtue. No one can invade it. We have Canada to the north, Mexico to the south. This is very good. Our interests are the two oceans that guard us, the Atlantic and the Pacific. And we must be strong there and everything else. Most other issues don't interest us. And, and because we're strong and basically, you know, nobody can invade us, how do we as American citizens play a role? Well, to be very careful to demand that all the good ideas they have at DOD and especially in the State Department are vetted, that the war must be in our interest and it must be winnable. The war in Afghanistan was not a 20-year war. It was a 40-year war. It began when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan right after the hostage crisis. And having invaded the Soviet, we wondered, what, what were they doing? We, we couldn't figure them out. They must be invading Iran. And so we had an operation called Cyclone with the Pakistanis and with the 
um, Saudis to fight the Russians. And we did. We won. We put the Taliban in office. <laughs> and so. Yep. But, but George, I hear you. But, you know, on Afghanistan, certainly we, we had a short victory and we stayed too long. In the case of Iraq, relatively few people made the decision for us to go there. And so, again, my question is, do we need to advocate stronger with with Congress? Uh, I mean, what can the average listener, viewer of this program do if they're uncomfortable with the positions of our foreign policy? Well, I mean, one of the things that has to be done is to hold our leaders responsible for the, losing the war. Uh, in the end, we could not have won Afghanistan. But we have to remember that before World War II, there were wars rare. I mean, we were still talking about the Mexican-American wars. They didn't happen. After World War II, we decided that we were both enormously powerful and responsible for the world. We took responsibility for it. And suddenly we found ourselves in small conflicts after small conflicts, not doing very well in them. And it is understanding the limits of power and convincing the public that there are limits. I think they've got it now. Okay. And insisting that when something happens, ask very carefully, does it matter to us? We cannot be the, what should I call it? We can't be the psychiatrist of the world. We'll come, we'll shoot you and make you feel better. It it's just doesn't work. <laughs> well, as the keeper of the world, we certainly could improve our game. That, that's for sure. Uh, when you look at the structure of your report and your forecast, I, I love the thinking that went into it, the way you put imperatives, you know, these countries or these regions must do this, constraints, they've got to deal with this, and then you've got your forecast coming out of that. It occurs to me that individuals and businesses can use that same kind of structure. Would you describe that thought process, please? Well, the first thing to understand is what do I need? What am I doing here? What, what must I achieve? Uh, businesses have that goal. It is focusing down on what it is that is necessary and boiling away the nice to have. Mm -hmm. The second thing to take a look at is why can't I get it? And how can I change that reality to achieve what I want? And based on the interests you have, understanding the limits, you can forecast for yourself whether you're going to make money or lose money. Uh, it's not that it's easy to do because the, the thing that Americans have the most is wishful thinking. They move into businesses with the finest intentions, but they don't really understand what it is they're doing. Then they don't understand the limits and they finally understand bankruptcy. And this is also our foreign policy sometimes. So one area that we've not talked about, and it certainly is a hot spot, is that is the relationship between Iran and, and Israel, and specifically on the JCPOA that regarded um, uh, and, and nuclear weapons for Iran. Well, the greatest catastrophe for Iran would be to have nuclear weapons because a world of hurt would come down on it. And the Iranians know it. They understand the West, same way Korea does. I don't want to have nuclear weapons. I want a nuclear weapon program. Hmm. Then the attack won't come. But really, the issue for Iran is it fought a war with Iraq. A million Iranians died in that war. It is terrified of the surrounding neighbor. It is far more hostile to the Arabs than it is to the Israelis. The Israelis used to supply weapons to the, the Iranians during that war. Uh, the, the real issue here is this. We've crafted this Arab coalition siding with the Israelis. The Abraham Accords. The Abraham Accords, which <laughs> terrifies the Iranians. This is their worst nightmare. You know, the Jews and the Arabs after me. So... We've got them in that position. We have to find something we want from them. It can't simply be get rid of your nuclear weapons and then you're in this situation. They have to be somehow integrated into something that gives them a benefit. It can't all be constraint. Well, 
the Israelis can't do it for internal political reasons. The nations in the Persian Gulf are terrified of the Iranians, of what they're going to do. And the United States really does not handle this. You talk about moving parts. How do you handle all these moving parts? I think Trump's greatest single achievement in foreign policy was the, these accords, these Abraham Accords. But now, what do you do with them? How do you handle them? How does it keep together? But I'm really not concerned about Iranian nuclear weapons because at the first sight of Israeli intelligence picking up that they've got them, they'll disappear along with Tehran. Well, George, I wish we had more time to explore this right now. We're going to have to come back to this because there's so much here we want to explore with you. Folks, I'm Jim Cathcart. I'm here with George Friedman and Jim Falk, and we want to thank you for watching Perspectives Matter. Tune in for more on these compelling topics and go to mcquistion.com for replays of our other recent programs. We are here to explore things that matter with people who care. Thanks for watching.